Hello, thanks for listening. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and I'm going to be talking today uh, in this presentation about the short story Sonny's Blues by James Baldwin. And I'm going to start uh, in this first presentation by talking a little bit about the historical context and specifically about jazz music. James Baldwin published this story in 1957. And Baldwin himself was uh, an African-American man and a gay man, and um, very concerned in his work and in his, in his life with the experiences of people on the margins and um, with splits, with, with internal conflicts. And that's, those are both issues that I think we see um, prominently in Sonny's Blues. As I said, it was published in 1957, and that's knowing that that date is important for understanding how this um, story might reflect on and express the African-American experience, uh, specifically the African-American experience in the mid part of the 20th century. So, of course, slavery had been over for almost a year as an, or excuse me, almost 100 years uh, as an institution um, with the end of the Civil War in 1865 that marked the official end of uh, slavery. Uh, but, of course, we know that things were not easy for the freed slaves um, and other uh, people of color after that. There were still many difficulties that they faced. Of course, the struggle to get uh, to protect the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the period immediately following the Civil War during the Reconstruction, there were many years where uh, there were many positive developments uh, in general overall in the African-American community in the United States. Um, there were uh, uh, many towns that, that grew thriving African-American communities and businesses. Um, African-Americans were uh, uh, taking political office. So there was a period of ascendancy, you might say, um, where there really was progress for African American uh, African Americans in their status, um, but with the end of Reconstruction, the turn of the century into the 20th century, and we have the imposition of the Jim Crow era in the South, with newly restrictive laws designed to clamp down on Black freedom, um, and in many ways reverse the gains made by the African American community in the decades following the Civil War. By 1957. We've had even further, more complex developments. Two world wars, World War I and World War II, in which black soldiers served alongside white soldiers. Um, and yet, despite their service, despite risking their lives, despite fighting and dying for uh, the, the uh, allied powers in World War I and World War II, um, these uh, black soldiers came home to find themselves, once again, second-class citizens. They risked their lives, but they did not see um, the benefits. They were not treated at home like heroes, like soldiers. They went back to being um, second-class citizens because of their race. On the other hand, uh, World War II in particular um, and the rise of fascism and then subsequently its defeat uh, did make many people, both uh, black Americans and uh, white Americans, much more cognizant of the and, and aware of the problems of racism and discrimination and the dangers of it. So while perhaps in certain um, mundane ways or in the, in the everyday experiences of many black people, um, there wasn't a lot of progress going on during these years, uh, in, including after World War II, there was symbolic forms of progress. There were symbolic forms of um, acceptance. And one of the most prominent examples of that, I think, is in the sports world. We have first Joe Lewis, the heavyweight boxer, uh, the black American who becomes a rallying figure for all Americans during the 30s when he beats the German boxer Max Schmeling. Um, and he became Joe Lewis was an American hero because of that. And America was ext Americans in general were very proud that an American and a black American even um, fought and defeated, beated, beat this uh, German, this representative of Hitler and, and the Third Reich in a boxing match. This is prior, of course, to World War II breaking out, but uh, still during the period of Hitler's ascendancy when people were recognizing that fascism was a, a dangerous uh, threat. 
So Joe Lewis was a rallying point for many Americans and, and a point of pride. And he went on to serve in World War II in the Army uh, very admirably. And that was another thing that made him a respected figure among many uh, white Americans as well as in the black community. After World War II, we have Jackie Robinson, the first uh, black baseball player to break the color lines and play in the white professional leagues. So we have forms of, uh, forms of progress in these very highly visible um, symbolic arenas, but that doesn't necessarily equate to progress on the, uh, on the level of real people in everyday life. And there's always, as many people started to feel, there's a certain sense in which those people, those black uh, celebrities that were uh, recognized and honored by white people, it was only within certain, certain, uh, re certain uh, barriers, certain limitations. That is to say, one of the reasons why Joe Lewis, for example, was accepted was because he was deemed acceptable. He behaved and presented himself in such a way that was not threatening to white America. He was a polite, a well-behaved, a, um, a nice person, a nice man who fulfilled many, who defied many of the racist stereotypes that whites had about black people, um, but also didn't necessarily uh, attempt to challenge. He didn't, he didn't pose himself as a, uh, as a black person challenging white supremacy over black people in, in American culture. He presented himself as an American, as a fighter. So he had, in a sense, had to disown his own blackness in the views of some uh, in order to become accepted. One of the reasons that, or, or another way to put it is that um, he was accepted in spite of the fact that he was black because he behaved in certain ways or presented himself in certain ways that was palatable to a white middle-class audience. In this way, Joe Lewis was very different from, for example, Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight champion, uh, bo champion boxer uh, from a few decades earlier, who was a scandalous figure, who was a very flamboyant, very bold, very brash man uh, who dated white women and who was harassed by the authorities because he was unapologetically himself. He didn't um, try to hide his blackness. He didn't act subserviently to white people. He behaved as an independent man and lived how he wanted to live, and that caused him a lot of problems. We could also compare Joe Lewis to the famous Muhammad Ali, the, uh, the most famous boxing, perhaps the most famous athlete of all time. Uh, Ali, who was born Cassius Clay, changed his name to Muhammad Ali in an act of when he converted to Islam, and that was considered a very radical act. Uh, Ali refused to serve in Vietnam, um, and he pointedly compared himself to Joe Lewis, compared himself to Joe Lewis as uh, Joe Lewis essentially as what's called an Uncle Tom, uh, someone who had betrayed his people, betrayed the black community in order to get ahead, in order to be, sub and so was subservient to white people in order to advance his own career, rather than staying true to his community, staying true to his identity, and um, rejecting white supremacy, rejecting racism, and being a bold, independent person. Ali uh, insulted Joe Lewis many times, uh, mocked him, um, and compared himself to, to Joe Lewis as a much more radical individual. And he certainly was. Ali was explicitly a figure of, for black power um, and identified, identified himself as black, in a sense, before identifying himself as American. Um, and he rejected the idea that he should have to serve America just because he was American because of the way America had treated black people historically. So the point I'm trying to make here with, with some of this historical context is that um, in 1957, this is also prior to the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement, people like Martin Luther King Jr. are just getting started, and the Civil Rights Movement hasn't... Um, uh, hasn't blossomed yet, hasn't really come into its own yet as a full-fledged uh, battle against uh, institutionalized racism and forms of oppression. So this is, we're at a turning point. We're at a point where there's a lot of pressure built up within the black community and within America at large. People dissatisfied with 
the things that have been asked of them, black people dissatisfied with the way that they have been uh, treated by the United States government, by the society of the United States, first uh, brought over forcibly as slaves, and then when freed, um, only given that freedom grudgingly, given limited forms of freedom, which were then, of course, reined in by Jim Crow, by, by various um, legislative attempts to restrict the vote, et cetera, et cetera, asked to serve in two world wars, and then comes home to still find themselves second-class citizens, um, denied opportunities, uh, harassed by authorities, et cetera, et cetera. So 1957, there's a turning point where people are, uh, some people at least, are thinking there needs to be something more radical done. We need to make a change, um, and we can no longer just uh, acquiesce to authority and say, well, we'll take what they give us. We need to demand our own freedoms. And this is why the 60s saw the explosion of uh, civil rights movements, uh, and and advocate advocate uh, excuse me activism um, by on the parts of women on the parts of uh, gay people on the parts of people of color all these movements erupted in the 60s because of this ongoing pressure this sense that uh, people were being left out of the American dream because of their identity. Now, why is this pertinent to the story? Well, I think we can think about the split that was occurring within the African-American community between, on the one hand, um, an older generation, most likely, a more conservative or traditional generation, a generation that had been uh, perhaps raised with different values and different imperatives, raised to uh, not make a fuss, raised to not cause trouble, raised in some sense to just deal with oppression and racism, to just... Uh, smile in the face of it and keep moving because there was little that could be done and a newer younger generation that was unsatisfied with the limited progress that had been made that felt that they had been promised things um, and those promises were not lived uh, were not were not uh, fulfilled who felt that they deserved more than they were given and did not want to just politely wait for freedom to be given to them politely wait for their rights to be given to them, did not want to smile in the face of racism, um, and was more eager for a more revolutionary change. And of course, while we might find ourselves personally more inclined to one side or the other in our own uh, outlooks, I think we should be able to see the challenge faced by both, that both have a certain perspective. Um, there are times when it's better to back down than die in the fight, so to speak. There are some hills that are not worth dying on. There are times, perhaps, when one does have to put aside the desire for freedom um, or, or be content with a lesser form of progress. And there are other times when one should be um, more militant, so to speak, when one needs to demand that oppression, that um, violence will not be tolerated. There, there is, comes a time when um, a movement needs to happen. So, thinking about that as, in some sense, a model for the split between the narrator and his brother, Sonny. On the one hand, we have the narrator, the older brother, who serves in the war, who is honorably discharged, serves honorably as a soldier, uh, who becomes a teacher, who follows the straight and narrow, so to speak. He gets married, has a child, does what you're supposed to do, is trying to teach the youth, to try to improve them through education. So he is trying to better himself, and he's trying to better his family and trying to uh, uh, better the people of Harlem, where he still lives. But he is, we might say, coloring within the lines. And then we have Sonny, who is dissatisfied with that life, who wants to be an artist, who wants to pursue the passion within him and express himself through music in a new way. And he finds himself dissatisfied with the limitations and constraints that are put on him by society's expectations. And so he 
breaks out or attempts to break out, but finds, um, as we see through his drug abuse and uh, the life that that leads him into, that he finds that it's um, uh, more difficult than he had expected and, in fact, almost dies, right, literally almost dies through his drug abuse um, trying to escape from this life. So it a, seems, on the one hand, a very stark choice. Well, there's um, – and because what happens to the narrator? Well, he does everything he's supposed to, but his daughter still dies. His daughter Grace dies of polio. So on the one hand, we have the narrator who – follows the the accepted path, does what he's supposed to, behaves, serves his country, serves his community, doesn't uh, uh, break expectations, doesn't color outside the lines. And he has some measure of stability, but he loses his grace. He loses his daughter grace. And on a philosophical or, or, or a psychological or metaphysical level, loses grace. And then we have Sonny, the rebel, the person who tries to break out, but nearly destroys himself doing so and is forced and, and never does really escape, right? He comes back to Harlem. He's still trapped in Harlem in some sense. But what happens at the end of the story when Sonny plays, when we finally see Sonny play his music and the narrator finally hears his brother, really, really hears him for the first time and through that music, they both come to, it seems, perhaps a better understanding of their heritage, a better understanding of their path, past and the path that has brought them there, not just them as individuals, but their whole community. So despite the differences, despite the split between them, there is a commonality in their past and thus perhaps a shared future that the brother and Sonny are trying to to find in their music, in the music when they listen to it together at the end, or rather when the, when the narrator, the brother, listens to Sonny play. And, and what they hear is the story of the suffering that, has, um, that, that their community has experienced, that black people have experienced through the, the horrors of slavery um, and on through the decades after that. And perhaps the future is not so much an attempt to escape from that, because it can't be escaped from, it can't be denied, it can't be erased, but to step, make the next step on the journey, to learn how to turn that suffering into beauty, into art, into the kind of art that Sonny makes, uh, turning that suffering into something productive, turning that suffering into a new way of life that uh, overcomes the struggles of the past while while building on them as well. And just as a, a little aside, side note, this also, um, we see that this split uh, and this difficulty uh, is something that goes back generations. It's not something that is new to Sonny and the narrator. Uh, we remember we learned the story of what happened to their father and their father's younger brother who had died. And in, in one of the only mentions of white people in the story, we learned that the, uh, their uncle that they had never known had been killed as a young man by some white people who were horsing around in a car, meaning to terrorize them, accidentally running the, the man over and killing him. In some ways, Sonny and the narrator are replaying that experience. Um, what is it that tears apart the family in the previous generation? Uh, it's the violence, it's the white, the violence of, of, of white people, uh, of the white community inflicted upon the the black family that's that's what occurred in slavery that's what occurred after slavery and in a certain sense it's a more systemic more institutionalized form of that same violence that keeps Sonny and the narrator apart it's that uh that authority or power of the white community that takes the narrator and makes him a soldier uh and then keeps him in his place as a teacher but only a teacher of other um, African Americans who, as he sees it, will probably not be able to escape Harlem either. So the very limited form of progress there. And then on the other hand, Sonny, uh, like the uh, deceased uncle, the musician, the one who tries to break out and, and express their, their own truth, express themselves as individual, is punished more 
uh, literally, more directly, um, the, the dead uncle by being run over, Sonny by being imprisoned. Okay, now let's swerve back to jazz. I said I was going to talk about jazz. Now, the story is called Sonny's Blues, and blues and jazz aren't exactly the same thing. In a sense, th the history between of, of jazz and blues and their relationship is extremely complicated um, and complex. But in a sense, we might say blues and jazz are both two separate types of music, right? two separate genres of music, um, and also that blues is a particular idiom within jazz, a particular language within the broader within the broader heading of what we call jazz. Uh, because on the one hand, there are musicians, um, there is a blues tradition, and the blues is a fairly defined sound and um, structure. And there are blues musicians going all the way back to, say, Robert Johnson, um, male and female uh, singers, musicians of all instruments going through. And this is the, the sort of popular tradition that eventually leads to uh, modern blues, modern R&B, and, of course, rock and roll. Rock and roll is a product of the blues. Without the blues, there's no rock, there's no heavy metal. Um, and, of course, also without the blues, there's no funk, there's no um, hip-hop. There's uh, So, you know, the blues is extremely important to all forms of modern American popular music. At the same time, blues intersects with jazz, um, as a musical style, and and jazz adopts blues as a fundamental part of its DNA. Um, without without ja blues, you also don't have jazz. Um, and at the same time, however, jazz and its developments, jazz has a certain complexity that blues tends to lack, uh, but jazz comes back and influences in many ways blues and rock and roll um, in some of their more complex developments. But let me talk a little bit about about jazz. Uh, so again, jazz, uh, that is, in a sense, including blues within it as a particular language, a particular sound within the very broad, almost infinite spectrum of jazz music. Um, for many people today, jazz is an old-fashioned kind of music. It's something they associate with um, the elite. It's something that's, that's a sort of cultural elite. Uh, it's something that's maybe a little snobbish. Um, it can be square, that is, not hip, <laughs> uh, uncool. Uh, it can sound old-fashioned, like I said. It seems old-timey, um, depending on, of course, uh, what jazz means to you and what you hear when you think of the word jazz. Um, and jazz, in a lot of ways, has become an academic form of music, a, a museum form of music. It's not a popular form of music anymore in the way that rap is, for example. So that's true that jazz has become, I think, has the the has become somewhat domesticated, somewhat tamed, and has become something of a museum piece in certain forms. There's certainly what we might call museum jazz uh, that is just jazz attempting to recreate historic sounds, recreate what people were writing and playing 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Uh, but there is, of course, jazz that is new, that is vital, that is developing. Um, it's even less in the popular eye for the most part uh, because it tends to be much more challenging even than, than older forms of music. But jazz, when it emerged, um, was and still remains a revolutionary force both in arts and in politics. Um, many jazz musicians have been outspoken politically. Jazz has been involved in, in politics um, jazz musicians have been, been involved in politics in many ways, and uh, jazz has been a form of international diplomacy. Jazz has been one of the, the United States' major cultural and economic exports um, around the world. And this is all due, uh, and this all tr goes back to the very radical um, idea of black musicians expressing themselves, writing their own music, expressing their own music and their own uh, artistic desires, n not just recreating music within the Western European tradition. Now, in my opinion, I'm a huge jazz fan, and I would say out of all the artistic and cultural accomplishments that uh, the United States has, has made over its uh, couple hundred year history in terms of visual art, 
film, literature, whatever, I would say jazz is the single most important cultural creation, cultural invention of the United States. Um, of course, I'm that's I'm I'm biased, and it's really impossible to rank these things ultimately. But for me, uh, jazz is one of the most important historical forces and musical forces um, in American history. So where does jazz come from? Uh, there are, of course, a number of sources, but it has a really fascinating uh, historical lineage. On the one hand, you have um, the West African musical traditions that were brought over by the slaves um, when they were forcibly brought to the United States. And these are traditions that are highly rhythmic, um, musicals, traditions that are very, very rhythmically based, lots of complex polyrhythms. They may be more simple in their melodies. They use a kind of simplified scale or a smaller scale compared to the musical scale used in Western European music. But they were far more complex in terms of their rhythmic structures in many ways. And a lot of this was because of the technology, of because of the uh, places and uh, role that music played in African society. It was often part of communal rituals. It was not uh, something like a form of entertainment for the elite in the way that, that music could function in Western European society. Um, so it, it had a very strong tradition that was brought over by slaves, um, also mixed with various uh, traditions of native Indians in the Caribbean islands where many slaves were brought and then um, before being brought into the United States. Uh, and uh, with uh, Native Indian traditions in the United States uh, in, in what was used to be Indian territory. So, again, there's these African and Indian traditions, uh, West African musical traditions. Then we have the gospel tradition and the American folk tradition. With the with enslavement often came for many uh, black slaves, education, indoctrination into the master's religion, which was Christianity, Protestant Christianity. And they were taught certain hymns. They were given certain hymns. Um, they were allowed to and encouraged, in fact, to sing Christian music, to sing gospel music, because it was believed that the stronger that a slave could be bound into the religion, um, that would make them more plot, more uh, uh, docile, easier to control, less likely to rebel or revolt against their masters. So religion was a part of the means of control. But of course, as with, with everything, um, people adapt and people change. And we know that gospel music and many of the songs sung by slaves were uh, turned into very powerful expressions of the suffering that they experienced. Many were used as coded uh, signals, coded songs, giving uh, directions and advice for people fleeing along the Underground Railroad or uh, slaves that were trying to flee to the north. Many of the songs had uh, sort of secret codes in them telling people where to go, what, when it was safe, when it wasn't safe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so the gospel tradition is its own, and, and American folk tradition is its own rich strand of music that combines um, with the West African traditions as part of jazz's DNA. And then the third main strand is Western European music. And it comes into jazz and the black community in a really interesting way. By and large, in the years after the Civil War and prior to uh, the imposition of Jim Crow laws and the sort of reintroduction of um, uh, institutionalized repression, the only black people who were trained in Western music in the techniques of Western music and Western in, in, uh, instrumentation, in the formal techniques at least, were people of mixed race. People who were, uh, they were often either the children of a slave who had been, um, had, uh, had been assaulted by a master, um, or perhaps uh, a marriage after slavery, after the Civil War. But by and large, only people of mixed race were trained in these formal Western techniques, um, often because they did not appear black. They were able to pass in white society, or at least were light-skinned enough that um, they were given a place as uh, a, a sort of lower place in white society, often as servants or um, uh, uh, entertainers. But when 
with the imposition of the Jim Crow era in the early part of the 20th century, uh, a reimposition of widespread systematic repression and oppression of black people, uh, many people of mixed race who had formerly had a lot more freedom and a lot more, uh, we might say, social mobility because of their mixed race status found themselves now classified as black, no longer able to um, move between one realm and the other, but they were sort of pushed down as white society circled the wagon, so to speak. And many of these people from uh, uh, many of these sometimes very highly educated people of mixed race or of lighter skin were found themselves pushed down into a lower socioeconomic strata and were um, now in a community with uh, people who black people who were poor, people who were children of slaves, black people who hadn't uh, necessarily had uh, as much opportunity and been able to progress in the years following the Civil War. So, and, and one of the epicenters of this is in New Orleans, in Louisiana. So we have then, on the one hand, these forms of traditional music and popular music, gospel, folk, and uh, West African music, um, highly rhythmic, highly participatory, very energetic. And on the other hand, we have the uh, very highly refined and complex techniques and notational styles and instrumentation of Western European music, which has a far more developed sense of harmony than many of the than than the other more traditional uh, types of music, and it's the combination of this on the one hand um, kind of academic music, academic European classical music, and popular vital rhythmic uh, participatory folk music that creates jazz. And to my mind, that's what makes jazz the quintessential essential American music um, and what gives it its longevity and its uh, endless transform transformability. The fact that it is, at its heart, a hybrid of all sorts of different musical uh, uh, strands um, and, and thus something that's able to constantly incorporate and um, rewrite and rework new sounds new musical languages into its own DNA. And it's also uniquely American because of the his, the complex racial histor history of it. Uh, jazz is black music. There is no getting around the fact that fundamentally jazz and blues are expressions and, and emerge from expressions of the black community, expressions of black suffering. At the same time, jazz has always been more than a single ra the music of more than a single race it has always had strands of european music indian music um uh, latin music right all these different strands have always been part of jazz from the very beginning so it is um in itself uh, a very complex hybrid just like the american racial uh, makeup is now when jazz first uh came on the scene it was both extremely popular almost immediately and extremely controversial. In fact, the name jazz was originally a derogatory name um, meant to, uh, it was spelled jazz, J-A-S-S, -S, and take off the J, and that gives you a, a suggestion of what they're trying to suggest about the music. Um, so it was originally a derogatory term, but it was vitally popular for reasons that I can't really explain. I don't know what made it take off. Um, but it was very controversial, one, because, of course, it was played by black musicians primarily, um, although very quickly there were many white musicians who uh, were both were very talented and, and capitalized in it and became uh, lovers and, and great advancers of the music, um, and some that were just out to make a buck, of course, and exploit it. But just the fact that it was black music being played uh, made it scandalous in some sense to, to certain segments of white society. More scandalous was the nature of the music. Jazz music was thought to be very lewd, illicit music, because especially early music, it was, uh, it was music that people danced to, and it was music that people would dance very closely to, that young people danced to. And 
it was seen again uh, by people in primarily in white society as a kind of uh, savage, barbaric music of a of a inferior race that expressed their animal lusts and natures with its uh, wild rhythms and sounds. And they were very afraid of their children being seduced by it. And of course, when when white kids started to like jazz music because their parents didn't like it, um, uh, white people were terrified that that their kids were going to be uh, ultimately perverted by this horrible music. And that should be a familiar story. When Elvis Presley came out, people lost their minds because he was playing black music and thrusting his hips. People freaked out, thought it was the end of Western civilization. Rock and roll and, and heavy metal comes out. People think it's the end of Western civilization. It's going to make kids worship Satan and kill themselves. And, of course, rap music, every subgenre of rap from gangster rap to horrorcore to this to that, every different subgenre of rap has been um, criticized and critiqued as promoting violence and crime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and being, generally speaking, the end of Western civilization. So that's something, it's an old story that we're familiar with. In Sonny's Blues, there are two jazz musicians that are named. The first is Louis Armstrong, whose nickname was Satchmo, or Satchel Mouth, short for Satchel Mouth, uh, because of the way he played. And the other was Charlie Parker, whose nickname was Bird, um, or Yardbird. Louis Armstrong is one of the two or three towering figures in the early history of jazz. Alongside a piano player named Jelly Roll Morton, um, Louis Armstrong is one of the people who we could say, in a sense, invented jazz. Uh, now, historians have long since abandoned what's called the, the great man theory of history. That is the idea that history is advanced by the actions of these singular individuals, these unique and amazing people. And we've long since abandoned that idea because we know that uh, people are, even the most inventive and uh, powerful and influential people, are products of their time as much as they are uh, influencers of the future. Um, that is to say, we take Louis Armstrong out of New Orleans uh, and we, we plop him as a baby in some other city, some other part of the world, some other family. Maybe he never play, picks up a musical instrument at all. Um, and it's also to say that if Louis Armstrong hadn't been there, someone else probably would have taken up the, the reins, right? Someone else would have been in that place. There probably would have been a different figure who emerged as one of the important um, and, and really dominant voices. And of course, even going beyond that, these are musicians. Musicians don't play alone. Musicians play with other musicians. Louis Armstrong, um, just as much as he influenced other players, was influenced by them. What other people played with him, what he heard, shaped what he played. Still, given all that, given the fact that, again, if it hadn't have been Louis Armstrong, if it hadn't have been William Shakespeare, if it hadn't have been, you know, someone else um, probably would have taken that spot, but it would have been different in ways we can't even imagine. So despite the fact that, of course, Louis Armstrong um, was not an island, was not a man um, who invented himself completely and had no outside influences, um, his particular vision, his particular voice was extremely influential in creating the musical form that we, we call jazz. And Louis Armstrong went on to become one of the first superstars of jazz, um, one of the first crossover stars, that is one of the first people to cross over from a black audience to a white audience, become, became one of the most beloved musical personalities in America and really in the world. Uh, he became a figure for American diplomacy. He traveled around the world um, as, an, as a cultural ambassador uh, on behalf of the American government. Um, as part of international relations. His music, of course, influenced people around the world. Um, and he was seen, uh, he was accepted in, in the way that, say, someone like Joe Lewis was by the white community because he had this sort of relentless positivity. When you hear Louis Armstrong play, even in his saddest songs, there's a sense that there's a smile behind the sound. And when you, when you see him, He's just a, a, a jovial, infectiously uh, happy figure with a great smile, 
um, and uh, a, a really wonderful, warm personality. And many of his songs became standards. He played many uh, popular American standards, and many of his songs became um, popular hits. Now, as you can imagine, just like with someone like Joe Lewis, the black athlete, the black boxer who became a rallying point not just for black Americans but for uh, um, all Americans, um, but then became somewhat of a controversial figure and was uh, looked down upon, dismissed in some ways by um, uh, younger generations in the black community as something of a sellout. The same thing happened to Louis Armstrong in certain ways. Because of his relentless positivity um, and his uh, seemingly seeming refusal to be openly political, to be openly critical of racism um, and the way black people were treated, even into the 50s and 60s, he, he lived a long life, um, was seen by some black people as something of a sellout. Um, and his musical style, uh, which today seems, you know, to many people hopelessly corny, even though it's, it's wonderful music, uh, his musical style started to be seen as restrictive as well. And so by the time of the 30s and 40s and 50s, um, musicians are really starting to rebel against the older style, the older jazz style of Louis Armstrong. And one of the towering figures, um, and again, another one of the, these people who is just so uniquely influential, whose personal voice so influenced musicians in, in all genres, on all instruments, was Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker was an alto sax player while Louis Armstrong was a trumpet player. Um, and Charlie Parker was one of the core players and perhaps the most um, innovative player of a group of musicians largely centered in New York playing what became known as bebop. And bebop as a form of music was radically different from older forms of jazz. Um, older form of jazz, uh, were very conducive to a kind of crossover into popular music because they were danceable, because um, it, it, it had, uh, they could adapt old American standards to a, to a swing style. So jazz had become uh, swing and big band swing had become very popular. It was music that was pleasant. It was music that was not very dissonant, even when it had solos uh, and, and uh, up-tempo uh, music, it was um, not, super complex, not very difficult to follow. Uh, bebop, as a style of music, radically upped the complexity. Um, for one thing, bebop music was often very, very fast, very up-tempo. Bebop music was far more harmonically complicated. And unless you're a musician, I, it, the, the details don't, won't really make sense to you. But um, essentially, uh, whereas older jazz styles and blues styles uh, sort of limited themselves to a certain number of notes and certain notes played against certain harmonic backgrounds. Bebop was much more free, um, substituting notes and playing notes and sounds which before would have been considered dissonant, ugly, um, and harsh, but playing them in such a way and in, in complicated patterns and at such high speeds that it sounded exhilarating and beautiful, at least to the people who were fans of it. Um, of course, bebop was derided by uh, traditionalist jazz critics as noise, as barbaric, um, because many of the, the musicians like Charlie Parker were uh, uh, figures with less than, less than savory reputations. Charlie Parker himself was a drug addict. There, were, there was a lot of drugs and crime uh, crossed over with the, with the jazz, uh, the bebop community. So ja uh, it was seen also as drug music, as music for junkies. On the Blackboard page, I'll, I've got some videos um, of some different samples of music, so you can judge for yourself how you think about it. But uh, bebop is actually a very complicated and very sophisticated form of music. Charlie Parker and, and the other musicians that he played with um, were, were extremely knowledgeable, extremely well-trained musicians. Um, and Charlie Parker himself was, was uh, uh, at the time of his death, was... Um, doing a lot of research in and, and work on very advanced uh, Western composi compositional techniques and harmonic techniques. So um, bebop was, again, just like jazz had been when it first started, 
Bebop was a new form of jazz that was controversial, that was seen as rebellious, as revolutionary, as dangerous, um, and as, for the people who were participating in it, for the people who were playing it, a new form of freedom, um, a new way of expressing themselves that they had never before had, in a way that they'd never before had the opportunity to do. At the beginning of this presentation, I talked about 1957, when this story was was published as being at a turning point when um, the older traditions or the older uh, uh, ways of dealing with oppression, dealing with life in America, were no longer satisfactory for many people in the black community, when there was a rebellion against the um, older attitudes of just put up with it. Uh, and this is what, of course, would lead into the 60s into the, the civil rights movement and movements for racial justice and other, other forms of social justice. Uh, and I talked about, I used the example of these sports figures like Joe Lewis versus Muhammad Ali. Joe Lewis, the, the black American who fights for America, whereas Muhammad Ali, the black American who says, I'm black first, I'm American second, uh, because that's the way my people have been treated. Um, and so Joe Lewis and this older, uh, somewhat more, I don't want to say subservient, but people who did not rock the boat, uh, a way of life that said, let's not be, let's not agitate too much, let's not cause trouble, let's make do with what we have and make the best of it, um, that was no longer seen as uh, legitimate and was no longer seen as a possible way of living for people um, of the Muhammad Ali generation uh, who f thought, no, it's, it's been too long, we need to demand our freedom, it's never going to be given to us, we're not just going to put up with it anymore. And the split in, in jazz uh, between the Louis Armstrongs and the Charlie Parkers, between the traditional jazz players, the Dixieland players like Louis Armstrong, and the new beboppers like Charlie Parker, of course, is even more directly appropriate to the split in Sonny's Blues. Uh, it's the same sort of, it, it models the same split between traditional and new, between conforming and uh, revolution, we might say, or rebellion that um, we saw in, in the sports example and that was happening in general in, in black political uh, awareness. And so we see this, uh, this is a specific split that's, that's referenced, of course, in the story. When the narrator, he's recounting when he first, when Sonny told him that he wanted to be a jazz musician, and he says, oh, like Louis Armstrong. And Sonny says, no, not like Louis Armstrong, like Charlie Parker, like Bird, man. Louis Armstrong, that's old-fashioned stuff. That's stuffy. That's, that's the music that the white man wants you to play. Charlie Parker, that's the new music. That's the music uh, of our community. That's the music of our self-expression. Um, and so we see that split in the music as well. Uh, and again, I think that takes us back to the end of the, the story when the narrator hears Sonny play and hears in that music not just something new, something strange that he can't understand. He doesn't just hear the strangeness and complicated uh, wh whir of notes flashing by of bebop that he'd heard before. Earlier in the story, he describes it as, you know, just sounding ca like cacophonous noise that he can't make any sense of. But he hears in it, even in the newness of Sonny's music, he hears the voice of the blues. He hears the old sounds. And I think at the same time, although Sonny doesn't come out and say it, we don't have Sonny say, oh, you know, I used to, to, to dismiss Louis Armstrong, but actually he is really important. In the way Sonny plays, in the way he goes back and forth, goes from what he knows and what is safe to more, more risky, more uh, uh, adventurous sounds, the way he finds himself in that story and the way he does it through the blues, through um, a more traditional, older uh, sort of folksier s side of music, uh, style of music, is a signal, is a sign of Sonny also coming to an, uh, uh, an agreement with the narrator. That is, he is not just seeing himself as purely rebellious. He, he's no longer trying to escape from the heritage, but he's trying to remake it, rewrite it, incorporate it into his music, and make it into something new and beautiful. So the old and the new in the music come together. 
just as the brothers come together, just as in some sense it's an attempt to, to unite, I would say, the black community in their shared experiences, in their shared desire for freedom, in their shared history of oppression. And the new and the old have to be incorporated in some way and something that is neither new, that is neither completely new, that is neither uh, divorced from the past, but is neither, uh, but is also not um, enslaved to the past, is the only path forward. That's the only path for true redemption. And that's what the blues are in some sense. The blues are a very old form. There's something that every blues song has in common, whether it was recorded 120 years ago or recorded today. There's something that all blues has in common. Blues is a music of sorrow, a music of despair, a music of loss, but it's also a music of joy, a music of catharsis, that is of, of purging oneself of those negative emotions, a music of self-expression. And even though there is something that the newest blues musician shares with the oldest blues musician, blues and jazz beyond it, I think offers to every musician the opportunity for a form of completely unique self-expression, even while incorporating the sounds, the voices, the experiences of the past. So that is going to be my end of this lecture on Sonny's Blues, uh, the history, historical context, and jazz. Um, if you have questions, of course, you know how to contact me via email, etc. Uh, otherwise, I will see you in the next lecture, next presentation. I wish you the day you wish yourselves. Take care.